There was a time, not too long ago, when the sea breeze flowed through the cottages on the ocean and passed over Ocean Avenue to cool the little town of Mantoloki. My father built a house around 1930-31 on Barnegat Lane in Mantoloki. It was about six houses north of Herbert Street. Actually, it was a property owned by a corporation and they divided the lots up in 90-foot lots. They were all bulkheaded, and they were for sale for $3,000, if anyone had $3,000 during the Depression. The world moved a little slower then. The houses were few, and with paltry possessions, there was always something to do. We used to build docks in the bay, you know, our own little you know, we'd, we'd get a hose and jet down into the mud, and get some old two by fours off the pile and build docks. My brother, my older brother and I, particularly Tommy. Carl Van Dyne, who was my first cousin, I idolized him. I was eight years younger than Carl and I desperately wanted to crew for him on his sneak box. And I knew that if I just went up and asked him alone, he'd say no. But I figured a time I saw that he was with his mother and I asked him right in front of his mother, Carl, can I crew for you? And I could see him wanting to say no, but because his mother was right next to him, his mother sort of went like this to him and, he, and, and, and I got myself a crew job, so. This is the story of Mantaloki, told by the people who live there. Mantaloking was one family. Life was sailing in Mantelope. We sailed all week except for Wednesdays. And on Wednesdays, we played tennis. And I sucked at tennis. I hated tennis. I hated Wednesdays. The independence we had as kids at the shore was so much more than today. You were either on the beach or in the bay or at the yacht club. It's the smell when you arrive of the salt air. It's the sand in your bed. It's um, not having to introduce yourself to anyone. I always felt when I came home that I was coming to go on vacation. Growing up in Manaloking, ah. as a kid in Manaloking, we mostly, I mostly sail. Bay, ocean, penguin shed. Right. I didn't know where else to go or what to do with myself. I'd uh, have lunch on my duck boat, uh, read my Hardy Boy books. And then I would, uh, uh, and then I'd go sailing all day. We lived right next to the Breakers Hotel, which was a thrill for kids. And do you know that the people in the hotel would get dressed in their bathing suits without pulling down shades? <laughs> Thumbs up, <laughs> you know. And we were there to see the whole show. The day that school ended, we would all pile into the station wagon. Um, my mother would drive us all down, and we would be down here until the day before school started in the fall. Once you got on the Manaloking Road, you know, I, I remember being excited because you'd start seeing sand on the shoulders and, you know, the beach. It, what was a, a two hour drive felt like a two day drive at that point, you know. When I was little, I remember Route 35 as being gravel and slow, and there were horses and carriages as well as old cars. When I was a kid, 
I think there are only 25 houses with lights on in the summertime. There were fewer houses and they were beach cottages. They were never meant to be lived in 12 months of the year. You didn't worry about the house. You swept the sand out. None of the floors were really finished. They were leftovers. You, you know, crashed on sofas and chairs. There was no pride. It was all for convenience. My grandmother's house, we didn't have a TV, ever. There was never a TV. We weren't allowed to have a TV in the summer, even though there were black and white TVs back then. I went to the rectory to see the moon landing, which was really fun. When we were kids, there was no internet, and TV reception was a little sketchy. At the dinner table, was there would be three generations of a family, and there'd be the grandfather and the mother and the daughter, and uh, they'd be talking about whether Susie should have gone left or right on the first weather leg that day. And there was real intergenerational transmission of, of a sailing knowledge and culture. It was all about books and listening to records and sitting around the dinner table just talking for hours. Henry Coley, his grandmother, Weedy, used to, she had a huge library of great books and she would invite us over to listen to her read stories like The Outermost House. Huge impression. We would memorize poems and recite them to the aunts and uncles and I, it, it seemed like it was a bit of a chore at the time, but it was, it was wonderful. when I was young, I mean, there were probably almost as many houses, but everybody was your cousin. Um, you know, you saw everybody at the beach, the mothers of all the kids would sit around in a circle on the beach, and that was called Vulture Circle, <laughs> talking all the gossip. The mothers up at the bathing beach, were they were called the hen party, and all the mothers in town would sit up there and knit while the kids swam. When I was a little kid, one of my favorite things to do was get up pretty early in the morning and walk over to the yacht club with a crab net in a bucket. I would probably check every single piling in every stretch of, of vacant bulkhead. If you were really lucky, you'd find a few doublers and perhaps at least once a week I'd find a softy. You got up in the morning before you even had a bowl of Cheerios, you went outside with the crabbing net and you waded around and tried to catch crabs and you're really trying to catch softies. You didn't need any bait at all. You uh, scoop the crabs right out of the water. And uh, one day I was looking at a crab and the crab was looking at me and moved and its old shell just dropped down. It was a soft, a soft shell. We'd go seining too and catch bait for fishing. And that was wonderful because the exotic things that we picked up. The most wonderful thing that we used to get in the seining net were seahorses, just little teeny baby ones, and then also the blowfish, and we could scratch their tummies and they get really big. One of the things we would do would get our seining nets and go down in front of the Lovering's house. They had a little beach, and two people would hold the wooden ends of the seining nets and we'd walk in the bay and lift them up and get a big bunch of sparing that we'd bring home to our, my mother, I don't remember who I did it with, 
and she'd flour them, dredge them in flour, throw them in butter, fry them up, salt them, and serve them to us. We'd sit there and eat them like french fries. If the bluefish were running, everybody in town wanted to know. So while the adults in the family would be running out onto the beach with their poles, the children would be sent across the street, across Route 35, to St. Simon's to ring the church bells to let everybody know that the bluefish were running. My dad, once in a while, he'd come home from work and he said, Bill, I think the clams are gonna run tonight. You wanna go get some sea clams? And we'd take a couple of pails and we'd go across the street, over the beach dune, onto the beach, and sure enough, there would be sea clams there. And my dad uh, loved the, the tongues. We didn't take the whole clam and just open it up and then scatter the rest of it for the seagulls to eat. One day I caught an eel and we had a terrible time getting it off the, uh, off the hook. And I came home and told my grandfather that I uh, had, we had the, caught this eel. Oh, he said, eels are wonderful. He went out and bought an eel and made me eat it. Eels were really gross and disgusting. We didn't like eels. Then. I was once telling a child who caught an eel that how you, how you skinned an eel. And she said, caught one just before I was going to a bay race. And my husband turned to me and said, we're not going to that race till you show her how you skin an eel. And so I had to teach her how you skinned an eel. And they're very, very slimy. I thought I was never going to get myself cleaned up after skinning the eel. Ed O'Malley tells a story that the way you peel an eel uh -huh. is you hammer it into a telephone pole and you peel the skin off, like. And while the kids were scooping up crabs in the bay, the pound fishermen were bringing in boatloads of fresh fish from the ocean. From the 1800s to the 1950s, pound nets were scattered up and down the east coast, from Sandy Hook to Cape May. So what existed at the Jersey Shore before the trains were these small villages with something of a summer business or, or you know, hunting, fishing, clamming on a very small scale. And then the trains start arriving at the shore, bringing an influx of people. But, but there's also an opportunity to send things back to the cities. So the clamming industry and the fishing industry start to thrive. By 1882, there was a fish pound uh, in Bayhead and in Mantelokeing in 1892. Pound nets, the fishery itself, was based on essentially telephone pole-like pilings that were driven off the beach, maybe three, four hundred yards at sea. And these were uh, nets that were set up to be a trap for fish migrating up and down the coast. And the fish would go into this trap and they would circle until the guys came out in the morning and dipped them out. They literally dipped them out. They had a net like bucket and pulled them up. And these boats would come back through the surf, and that was remarkable. They'd come through just about sunrise, and uh, when the waves would break on the stern of the boats, it'd be a sparkle of light coming up. Just beautiful. get out and they'd hitch up a line to the bow of the skiff, which was also tethered to a pole embedded in the beach up by the dunes. And then the horse would take the loose end of the line and with a series of blocks on each end of it, draw the boat on rollers up through the surf, up the beach. And uh, once it got up on dry land, the fishermen would offload the fish out of the skiff. The, uh the crew was very, very kind to little kids as they, hold, as they hold the boat back. Very often they would throw you a few fish. These were, this was not a small operation where you had one net and four poles. You're talking about dozens and dozens of poles and nets. The way you built a weir was you took two pound boats, you, you went out and, and you set 
pilings, essentially, into the sea seabed, and then strung net around those pilings. The way you set the pilings, it was a sandy bottom, where you'd tie two boats together and you'd get this thing vertical standing with a hose alongside it and a high pressure stream of water from a pump to, to jet it down into the sand and just keep doing that. A, a horrific amount of work and on a surface, you know, that's just all over the place. The fishermen would take you out to the nets if the day was calm. And unfortunately for me, the, the one day we went down, my father and I, they deemed it too rough. On one occasion, I did get a ride on a pound boat. It wasn't a rough day. That's probably why they took this little kid. And it was well, awe-inspiring in the sense it was all new. They would lay up alongside the pound, and they would lower one side of the net, and they would bail the fish out. There was such an array of fish as you don't see today. There was one time where two children took a penguin, which was a type of sailboat, out in the ocean, and they were sailing out to the pounds. And I thought the parents on the beach that day would have a fit. They all stood up and they were all complaining. And needless to say, when those children finally came in, they got a heck of a talking to. Well, the fish pounds were wonderful. For one thing, you could catch a lot of fish around them. The, the pound nets were, of course, structure. So you're going to find bait and f fish outside of even the nets. Uh, and and uh, so it was a good place to fluke fish. So you'd get right next to the pound nets on the downwind side, right? Kind of see with interest what was in there, if anything, and, uh, and then just drop over and drift away from the nets and start fishing. Pound fishing was very bad on, on so many levels, you know, ecological, environmental. They were at odds with the resorts that they were surrounded by. And of course, they were very much at odds with sports fishermen who, who felt that they were depleting uh, the fish that they were trying to catch. With the pound nets gone, the horses now came from the west, bringing goods from Osbourneville. When I was a youngster, there were a lot of merchants that would come to us as opposed to our going to them, their place of business. And uh, they would have their business on a vehicle of some sort, and they all drove by, stop, ring the bell. The Iceman came by horse and wagon. Actually, Brett Bucock was the milkman, and the vegetable and flower man came by wagon, horse and wagon. And you would go to Height and Lawrence in Bayhead once a week to get meat. We didn't eat much meat. Because uh, remember, we don't have refrigerators, we have ice boxes. Across the Manologing Bridge was a totally different world in a way because it was the world where year-round people lived. That's where the huckster uh, had his farm in Osbourneville, west of Manologing. Even, even when I was a kid, uh, Mr. Gant would drive over uh, in, his, in his powder blue, I think it was a Ford pickup truck with all of his vegetables. And he'd, come in the driveway and you'd hear the call, vegetable man. He had the freshest vegetables. 
And on the back of his truck, he had a scale that would swing back and forth. And you would hear him coming because it would be hitting the frame of his, of his truck. Grandmother's cook was the one who went out and negotiated with the huckster. And she was very stern with him about the quality of his produce. And, but I would go out and watch the whole process. This guy would have strawberries and blueberries and fresh corn every day. And if you wanted some really good stuff, you bought it from him. We had a general store, though, downtown. And all the summer people shopped there. My family would never dream of buying groceries there because it was so expensive. But it definitely it was the candy store and the ice cream store to go to, for sure. Mr. Pohemus would be standing on the other side of the counter and you had a list and you went down the list and Mr. Pohemus went to various shelves and cupboards and so on, assembled your order on the store. There was none of this uh, self-serve with a basket that you wheeled around. The railroad came twice in the morning and, and then the afternoon, getting down about 7.30 and bringing the mail, which was very important. And so Mr. Polemus had to sort that, and he, it took quite a while. He didn't have very, oh, he did have a helper. The train would bring, besides passenger service, they would bring kind of the necessities for each town. Uh, among these w would be a coal and lumber, ice and milk, and actually this was how the post office delivered mail also in those days, sometimes twice a day. The porch was only about 10 feet from the railroad track. So when I was only three or four years old, I can remember the southbound train around 6.30 in the morning, roaring through, and the house would shake, and I would, but surprisingly, after a while, I would sleep through it. Southbound train would blow its whistle for the crossing at Herbert Street, right at our house, and it would rattle the windows. Uh, it was so loud. My father went down and talked with the engineer one day and asked him if he could uh, tone the whistle down a little bit. It would still be legal, you know, you had to blow the whistle. Uh, and the engineer said, absolutely. And he'd just give it a little whoo <laughs> as he went by. From uh, Manaloking for a day excursion to Philadelphia there and back, you could get for a buck 25. When George Niebel first got into politics in Manaloking, if there is such a thing, right. He was running for council, and he was asked by the Asbury Park Press, what's your program, what is your platform? And he said, I just don't want anything to change. And I said to myself, that's the guy I'm going to vote for <laughs> every time he runs. When I was a kid, I don't think there was a junior sailing program. The sailing programs at the yacht clubs in my era, late 50s, were very different from what they were now. At that time, all they did was we, we went out, we got, went to the dock, we rigged our boats, we went out sailing and they set out marks or used fixed marks and all we did was race. There was really no coaching at all. They didn't tell you how to do it. You had to figure it out for yourself. And I think that's why we lost, lost a lot of people. We would start out with a dozen people at the beginning of the season and end up with three who really succeeded in sailing. There are two types of races. One would be for a monthly series with points, and the other races were just for fun. And some uh, mother would buy a jar of sour balls and we'd have a candy race. You 
you start out on a small boat, we didn't have duck boats here. They had had a ton of duck boats, but we had maws. Eventually, Dave Beaton, somebody went and said, Dave, we need some more smaller boats for the yacht club. He built three in one winter. My brother had the snig, and he was cleaning up, so they thought I should have a boat to try racing. All it had was M3. That's why I know they built, he built three. We were not a big group because after all, our group was the Depression year. And you didn't have a lot of children in the middle of the Depression. I grew up selling duck boats. We would do it all day. In the morning, here on Barnegat Bay, usually it's a light northeast wind. So when you're learning, you don't get scared, you don't tip over. And in the afternoon, we get the sea breeze and it blows 15, sometimes 20, and you tip over a lot. And you learn that tipping over isn't the worst thing in the world. You just get wet and they have to tow you back. The great thing about duck boats is they're double-handed. You get to either crew for somebody who's older. Like, think about it. When you're a kid, somebody who's two, three years older than you, who you look up to, to be able to be in a boat with them, even if you hate sailing. Like, duck boats are great, right? Like, hey, I'm hanging out with Sarah West, whatever. She wasn't going to hang out with me, right? right? Unless so, she was forced to. Yeah, well, no, unless she needed a light crew. Right. I, I crewed for both white twins. They took turns running the boat. And they sometimes fought about it and everything. And uh, I was crew, and I wasn't their top crew, which annoyed the hell out of me. Because I had been playing with them, you know, since I was like this. I was not a great sailor. I, I crewed better than I did um, skippering. I'm much better at, at, and I'm not a bad sailor, but I just, I was a little afraid of it. I just became petrified of tipping over. I, I did, thought maybe I'd drown or something. I, I hated it. When you first crewed on a duck boat and a southerly came in, I mean, yeah, it was terrifying. We would be out sailing in 20 mile an hour wind. And, and by the way, back in the day when we had the sailing school, they, did, they, they didn't cancel races unless you had a hurricane. When the wind would howl, Carl Van Dyne would get his fin out and he would go out and he'd be the only boat on the bay out just uh, sailing you know, down towards seaside, coming back, jiving, 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 jiving all the way back. So I'd get my duck boat out and I'd go down bay and, uh, and then I'd come back. And you know, I couldn't understand why I couldn't get my boat planing like his boat plane. But... My instructors that when I was sailing that really influenced me, well, my first one was Muzzy Barton. I had Will Burson was one of them. Harriet Barton was one of them. She was amazing. She's always like, you guys, and get psyched, you know, and I never forget that. I would say, come on, you guys. Let's get going. Let's get out, get out on the water. Come on, you guys. That sort of thing. I don't know why I did it. It was hard to wrestle up those youngsters. The biggest one I remember was my cousin, Harriet Barton. She took me under her wing and, and really helped me get into sailing. My early instructors were, what the names I remember were people like Nancy Van Dyne. My cousin, Peter Ill, was the head instructor one year. Betsy Lucas was one of my instructors. Meg Lucas was one of my instructors. Kirby was one of our instructors. Yeah. <laughs> one of the most colorful instructors we had, the fun, fun guy, was Frank Tuberty. This is Mary Jo Campbell's brother. And he would, he was just a delightful person, yeah. would do fun things. We'd have races in which the object was to finish third. <laughs> so, we, so, so we had a, the object of this race is to finish third, says uh, uh, Frank Tuberty. Well, we have the race. It was a downwind finish. Who gets to the finish line first? It's Peter Komet. 
Peter Komet thinks this is just bullshit. He's not going to try to finish third. He wants to win. <laughs> so he goes across. <laughs> it but Mandalo King probably had the best sailing program in the country and a really pioneering sailing program and it was thanks to two people Mike Spark and Gary Saya. I taught at Mandalo King Yacht Club the years 1965 through 1967 and my first year at Man Looking Yacht Club, as I remember, I lived on the property and I was the only instructor for something like 30 to 35 duck boats and a half a dozen uh, penguins, a couple sneak boxes, and a bunch of M scouts. Mike was here first, and uh, I came here, I guess, in. Uh, 67 and taught with Mike and then he left and I taught I was a head instructor in 68 and uh, it, it was a uh, it was a great program uh, it was of course in duck boats and they were all good kids best sailing instructors ever, Mike Sparks and Gary Sayo. Mike was a great, great instructor. We were so fortunate to have Mike Spark and Gary Sayo as instructors. We loved them. And Mike Sparks was so fabulous. Like, he would run the tow in the worst weather. He would stay after and make sure everybody was put away safely. Um, he just, he really served the kids of Manaloking. As did Gary, who was totally handsome. <laughs> Mike Sparks, he's just a fabulous human being. I'm very thrilled to be able to say that. Mike was the one who sort of instilled the importance of um, organization. You know, lines had to be coiled, cleats had to be done right, and if they weren't, you, you didn't get to go out. Mike was like a drill sergeant. He was not the marshmallow he is today. We were scared of him. And he was recruited as sailing instructor by Gardner Van Dyne. And he really invented the modern sailing program as far as I can tell. There was a really, that I instituted a very strict, you know, inspection and the cherished scrub brush award as the kids really tried to work for. You know, I used to wear white gloves and I would go under the floorboards looking for sand to get stuck on my white gloves. That's how hard I was. But they all rose to that occasion. Gary was easygoing. He was a really good sailor, and he was a really good racer. He could really teach you a lot about, about racing. Gary Say was just so bright. All-American at uh, Dartmouth, terrific sailor. I remember I think it was Gary Saya saying to me once when I was, I was young, and Gary would say, Peter would be the greatest sailor in the world if he could just control his temper. <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike kicked me out of the Yacht Club more times than I could count. He didn't take, uh, he, he didn't take much of my crap, and, uh, uh, and, or any of it. Yeah, I could have kicked Peter Komet out of the sailing program almost every day. You know, I had to bite my tongue many a time. We needed him. Uh, yeah, well, Peter Komet uh, was unique, but he wanted to learn, he wanted to sail, and he did it competitively. And I can remember going to Connecticut with him uh, in, I think it was Blue Jays. And I mean, uh, you know, what did he know about Blue Jays? He didn't know anything. But he managed to learn, and I think he won the, the regatta. Peter sort of prided himself in being I wouldn't say the class clown, but he liked to be a thorn in the side of the instructors. He was forever jabbing at, at Mike Spark, and he was forever kind of on the edge in terms of getting in trouble, but... but um... Peter Komet had his 
problematical side of his youth. Of course, he's grown out of it today. Has he? Well, let's just say that he has. Nan Benedict, did she toss me off the tennis court? I, I, more than once, or? They were never gonna kick him off of the out of the tennis program, no matter how bad he was, how misbehaving he was, because he was such a great athlete. And they were never, ever going to throw him out of the sailing program. <laughs> so the best sailors when I was in duck boats were actually women in Maniloking. People like Sally Van Dyne, Lee DeCamp, they were my main competition. Of course, my sister Jan. The best one was Peter Chance, but he just quit sailing uh, duck boats because nobody could beat him. He got tired of winning every single race. He could not be beat. Peter Kometz, Peter Chance, Willie DeCamp. Peter just sort of took off for the stratosphere and I remained immortal. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think you won some championships in your day, too, in scows and, right? Yeah, yeah, a few. Carl Van Dyne was way out there. Dan Hurley was a very good sailor. Probably the best that I was close to was Carl Van Dyne, who was my cousin. Carl Van Dyne, primarily, he and I were competitors throughout our childhood sailing careers. I think next was probably John Goebel. My sister, Ellen Earl and my cousin, Chris O'Malley. The best of my group was, uh, was Tripper McShane. Henry Coley was part of my gang. I don't remember Henry that much out on the water because he was tricking up his duck boat, working in the basin, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Van Dyne, John Benedict. Well, Andy Shuttle was a very good sailor, and so was Paulding Phelps. Willie and Peter were always the measuring stick for me anyway. David Wright was really the first person. He won the Laser M on the Bay. Stu Tubbs was a great sailor. Billy Brecht. Billy Brecht was my hero. He's kind of the bad boy, uh, loudmouth John McEnroe of the duck boat class. Right. And after mastering your skills as a junior, it was on to the Barnegat Bay. In about 1944, I sailed in the BBYRA. The first year I sailed a, a moth boat, uh, I did very well and I did win the championship. I sailed in the BBYRA since sometime in the 40s. I think I won my first Bay Championship in 47 or 48. I enjoy sailing and competing and not trying to beat anybody. I just like to sail. In the Chance family, everyone was expected to learn how to sail and to excel at sailing. It was pretty much forced initially, um, and then you either took to it or you didn't. Sure. After some BBYRAs, I would go home and there were some protest situations and my father would get out his little sailboats and the little buoys and he'd say, okay, what happened? And why was this right? And why was this, was this wrong? And it was, that was, he was taught us a lot.
After I graduated from college, I immediately got invited to sail on Courageous in the 74 America's Cup. But when that cup was over, I, I really was looking for the same level of competition uh, in, in, in dinghies, because I couldn't afford a, you know, a 12 meter. <laughs> and, and a bunch of my friends were sailing East Cows in those days, and Ronnie encouraged me to consider the class. I wanted to go where the action was. And the action in those days was on Barnegat Bay. So I joined Man Loking because I knew Runny very well, and I bought an East Cow. I think it was like mid-70s, and started sailing in the summers down there every weekend. And then, then I, I was getting involved like in 1979, I was doing a cup with Dennis in 1980. But I'd come and go and sail the scow because that was where the competition was. And some of the competition wasn't so good. We would crash into other boats <laughs> frequently to a point where we broke five masts in one summer, one season of 10 BBYRA races. One time my sister Cynthia had to sail the Rothenhausen sneak box to keep it in the series. So she was probably 11 with a whole big crew of other 11 year old girls. And we sailed by and they were nose diving and everyone was jumping overboard and handing out life jackets and my sister was crying and we kind of just sailed by. <laughs> Ann Benedict was a very good sailor when I was growing up and I crewed for her. She was very precise on how heavy the crew was gonna be. So sometimes I weighed too much. A couple of times she dumped me at, say, Shore Acres, and how was I supposed to get home? I remember that. I, you know, calling up my parents who didn't even know where Shore Acres was. I had to spend the day there. We wet sailed the boats. Therefore, every week we had to turn them on their side and sand them to get the algae off the bottom of the boat. And then we would tow them to the race, and we had to ride in the boats to tow them to the race. They wouldn't allow you in the tow boat. You had to sit in the sneak box and ride all the way down to Seaside Bridge and past Seaside Bridge into Tom's River. H.H. H. Harks did a drawing of Barnegat Bay and Barnegat Bay Yacht Racing. In that picture is a mantelloking tow with Captain Downer towing 15 sneak boxes on which my brothers and sisters were. I wasn't old enough yet, so I'm on top of the dune watching my father surf fishing in the ocean on the beach in Madeloki. I got a sneak box, that was 1941. It was gas rationing, so there was no tow to a race. So we would sail to wherever the race was on Friday afternoon and then hopefully had a parent who had a good enough gas ration card that they had some gas in their car and they could come down and pick us up. There was a rooster which went to the winner of each race and when you won it, you would put your sale number on the binding for the rooster and you would hang it up in your house and then you would bring it back the next weekend. Whoever won it the next Saturday would get it, put their sale number on it. So at the end of the season, you had the record of who won every race for that class in the BBYRA. Whoever won the last race got to keep the rooster. In those days, when I was sailing in the BBYRA, everybody came in for lunch, and you'd tie up your boat, and you would get a lunch uh, as part of your entry fee, and you did sort of commingle with your peers. But we would go to lunch and see all our friends and meet people and have that social interaction till the afternoon races went, and that was a huge part of it, and it just doesn't exist anymore. The good part about going down bay with everybody from Man Looking Yacht Club was at lunchtime, we would all get back to the yacht club wherever sponsored it, and we would have a really good lunch and enjoy talking to each other about how the race went and what was new, and that's how you made your friends. Now, they kind of go and they eat out on the bay, and they don't have quite the camaraderie that I feel we had as children. 
I can remember when I was probably 10 or 11, when the Bay Race was over on Saturday, all the little kids, 10 and 11 year olds, would rush down to the Yacht Club because the East Gals would be coming in. And they're bringing the East Gals up on the winches and Ronnie Coe Lee would pay you a quarter if you would bail out after they hosed down the East Gal. You know, those old wooden East Gals, you had to bail them dry to keep them fast. So we got paid, I think it started out as 10 cents, but eventually, escalated to 25 cents. So you'd rush down to the Yacht Club after the Bay Race and help bail out the East Gal for a quarter. And then when you had a quarter, you had died and gone to heaven. You could go get a Coke for 10 cents out of the Coke machine. You could run over to the general store and get three other candy bars. Where did the time go? It seemed like we had more back then. It seems now that we gravitate to the places where time stands still. As a kid going over to Beaton's, I, I always had this feeling there was something special about it. There was a, there was a reverence, people respected it. There were all kinds of old boats, old wooden boats at Beaton's that you could go over and it was like the history of sailing on Barnegat Bay. Beaton's Boatyard in the, in the early 50s was just a wonderful place. Uh, Pop ran the show. His son Lolly was a uh, right-hand man. Tommy wasn't even born. Uh, so it's a long, long time ago. This is, what, 70 years ago or more? My father was David Beaton and he was born in Scotland on September 9th, 1886. <laughs> and uh, he came to America in 1925 to uh, get a better life, a better job. Yeah. And, and, what is and he uh, started working in the Johnson Boatyard. Boat yard. If you were a boat builder looking for an opportunity, you, you moved down the shore along the coastline as the train started bringing people in. So, so you might start your career at one of the yards on City Island or in the New York area, but, but as soon as you could scrape together enough money, you move, move down the coast and get your own operation going. He had a friend that had come over here before him, John Robertson, and, uh, and that's how he started working in Johnson's, because he was already working there. So he came over here and he left the family, <laughs> left, the family. <laughs> left the family in Scotland. <laughs> and we came over two years later and he had built a house on Hans Place in Point Pleasant. We came by boat, I think it was called the Cameronian, and we came into New York. And I believe my father's sister, because they, they lived in Staten Island, they had fish stores in Staten Island, and I think she uh, sponsored him. And that's why we were able to come into New York instead of Ellis Island. Pop Beaton was a wonderful man. He used to work for the people who started what is, had been in my years, the Winter Yacht Basin. And he actually had a falling out. He did a boat, boat job, a varnish job for Runny Colee. And when his boss found out about uh, him doing the job for Runny, he fired him. He fired Beaton. Beaton at that point was positioned to buy a little piece of marsh over on Jones Side Pond, and that's where he built the little boat yard and the boat shed. And my grandfather and some of their friends uh, preserved the land to Swan Point, so it wouldn't be developed. But what they did is they carved out a section and sold that to Dave Beaton, uh, which is now Tide Pond. When Dave Beaton wanted to add onto his place, the garage in Mandaloki was taken down and many of the boards from the garage were used to build his next building. Dave Beaton was a character and such a sweet gentleman. 
To me, he was, he's kind of a classical Scotsman. I, I mean, he didn't emote a lot, but he was, if you asked him a question, he was more than happy to give you the answer and lend you the tools and point you in the right direction. His accent was actually hard to understand. His son was raised entirely in the United States and he had a Scottish brogue too. My dad had a, the ability to mimic, so he would mimic his Scottish accent and he and Davy Beaton would just hoot and holler and tell tall stories and he was just a characterful older gentleman. Incredible sense of humor but it was like these short little bursts of something and if you could understand his uh, his Scottish brogue and dialect you could you could pick it up sometimes you were like uh, I don't know what he said, but... <laughs> he was born in, in direct Scotland, and he worked in the shipyard there from the time he was like 10 or 11. And he just used to tell me it was pretty easy because you didn't have to work until the sun came up. But you didn't go home until the sun went down. And as a young man, because he was strong and tough, they would give them the, the lousy jobs, for example, cleaning the bottoms, uh, rough bottoms of boats underneath, so you're on your back with a crane all day. So he was raised tough. Old Pop Beaton didn't, didn't think kindly of uh, power sanders and things. If you didn't do it by hand with a block, you were a slacker and <laughs> it wasn't right. I would ride my bike across the bridge and I'd go in to Beaton's and Dave Beaton would be there and he would get me whatever part I needed. He would always know how I did it in the races the day before. If I was selling a sneak box and I'd won the BBYRA race, he would know it. And he always took a keen interest in knowing the success of his kids in sailing on the BBYRA. Because even though he worked all day, every Saturday, et cetera, he always knew the results of the races. If you broke a mast, and sneak boxes did break mast, he would have had it ready, and you had to go on the BBYRA, he'd have it ready for you the next day. Yeah. He would do whatever you wanted right then and there, and or come back tomorrow and I'll have it done for you. One time I broke a mast step, and I think I, two people biked it over, and. He looked at it and said, oh, come back tomorrow and I'll have it fixed right away and so you can race tomorrow. He would do it and sometimes he wouldn't get asked for money. He just loved working with kids, working on boats. Yeah. What a great man. You would never think he would have taken an interest in how you were doing or the fact that you had a penguin and that you were sailing, um, but he did. He, he kept a finger on the pulse of what was going on across the bay. He knew everybody, he and Lolly knew everybody. And they treated them with respect. They weren't these little kids to get them out of the way. They were interested in teaching them how to fix and repair things. Every summer, we would take the junior sailors from the Manilouki Yacht Club, we would take their duck boats and they would sail across and tie up at Beaton's. And, there, and then we would walk into the shed and Lolly and old man Dave would all take us under their wing and walk us around the yard, take us up in the rigging shop, show us either a penguin or a sneak box under construction or a duck boat under construction in those days and explain this is how your little yacht got built. It, and every year it was the same and the kids absolutely loved walking through the sawdust and the smell of the wood and all that good stuff that goes with being in a wooden boat yard. He, he was very interested in all the kids in Mount Logan. That was his life really, he, he loved it. Anything to do with the kids in Mount Logan and the boats, he, he loved. I have a picture of Dave Beaton as an old man and he was being honored at the Mount Logan Yacht Club and he's surrounded by tiny little kids who are today in their 60s. You just had this wonderful image of this respected, grandfatherly old man who was a core of the tradition in our area. I was one of the kids who was at the awards ceremony where Dave got this 
award and I remember him being incredibly surprised. He was very humble. They had to think of some, some excuse to even get him to show up. And uh, once he did show up, he had to be kind of pushed up onto the stage over here. And uh, um, I, th I think he was very honored and I think it really made, meant a lot to him. The greatest trophy you can win at Manilukin Yacht Club is called the David Beaton Trophy. And it's for the person who contributes the most to any aspect of the Yacht Club. And the best people in Manilukin have won that award. And it's such an honor to win the David Beaton Trophy. I think the Beatons looked beyond just the profitability of the yard, not to say they might not have wanted to be making more money, but there was a kind of a humanity there that we'll take the time to help this guy get over the hump, which doesn't exist today. It, it's a very warm place. Uh, it's old enough now that you, can, you just have a sense of the story, right? It, it, it's rooted there as much as anything can be on the marshes of South Jersey. <laughs> so much of what happens in life is the result of just the accident of who is where at what time and, and the fact that Dave Beaton chose our area and, and came here is just been of such benefit to us and we would, our whole area would be just completely different if he hadn't been a part of it. And so the generations of Beatons would shepherd over the families of Mantaluki. And the families of Mantalokan? Well, let's see if you can follow along with this. One of the important values of Mantaloking is everybody was related to everybody else. So the kids really couldn't get in trouble, but at the same time they were safe. Life existed in this little tiny town where you were related to half the people and the other half were good friends of your family and everybody was, was Aunt Jane and Uncle John and whether they were related or not. Everybody was related to everybody but us and we were like the strangers uh, because the Pillings were next door and then the Pillings were across the street and they, you know everybody knew everybody from Philadelphia. Manloking, I think, may be one of the furthest north towns on the Jersey Shore where you have a heavy Philadelphia uh, presence among the summer people. And I'm not sh sure that that is the case in Bayhead. Very close connection between Manloking and Philadelphia, and still is. Um, one family in particular uh, founded the first art gallery in the country in Philadelphia in 1822. It was called the Earl Gallery. Most of Manaloking is my family. My daughter, when I brought her down there, she said, is everybody my cousin? I just said yes. <laughs> Sam is a, uh, he is an uncle. Yeah, so he's a cousin to me. He's an uncle to our children, even though they're the same age. <laughs> Jan O'Malley and Peter and Britty, who's no longer with us, and Jan, did I say Jan? Jan, Peter, oh, Eleanor. Ellie's up in Jamestown. So they're still my cousins, but their father and my Aunt Janie were divorced a long, long time ago, and he was remarried a couple of times and had, I think, at least four, six, eight more kids. Harriet Barton's um, mother is an Earl. So it's Harriet, Harriet Earl and then Connie Earl. And then the Earls that lived in front of me, I can't remember her, Jane, who was Jane? Sam Chance was born an uncle. <laughs> right? Sam Chance has nephews and nieces that are older than, than he is. This was, and I couldn't tell if he was proud of that or self-conscious about it when we were kids. My great-grandfather brought his children from Philadelphia down to Manloking 
and they were very prolific and they had families and brought their families down and before you knew it I would say 60 percent of the population of Man Loking were relatives of mine in some way or shape. The Earl's chances are on one side who that follows in I think the Tim White and stuff falls into the, that category and then it's like the Runyon, Coley's, Bucox and we're in that chunk but I'm sure there's crossover. So there was Edgar, uh, what was? Tell me everybody you're related to. Jesus. So my grandfather, um, Murray Earl, um, had the house on Bay Avenue um, with my grandmother, Isabel Earl. And um, my aunts and uncles, um, Aunt Janie Lindenmeyer Earl, um, Aunt Connie Pilling Earl, my mom ha Harriet Hatsey Earl, my uncle Jim Jimmy Earl. You know, then there's the Pilling side. So I have a first cousin Ross Pilling, and um, Isabel and Margaret Pilling who were sailors. My son John Manderson was 11, I guess. They had a dance one night that they put on themselves at the at the Mandalorian Yacht Club and they decided they wouldn't dance with anyone to whom they were related by blood or by marriage. And there was one kid standing in the middle of the room. If you were playing Spin the Bottle with a group of your friends, you always had to question the person across from you because you didn't want to be sitting across from your second cousin or your first cousin and having to kiss them, and that was challenging. Lance White is a Guillemotti who well, Lance White's wife, Jane White, is a Guillemotti, and the Guillemottis are, who's the people that live in front of them? Uh, Van Dynes. Janie Van Dyne was an ill, and uh, Gardner Van Dyne was, Carl's father was my godfather, as was Ronnie Coley. Rick and I are first cousins once removed. Henry Coley is, uh, could be a cousin. I believe that his sister is married to a Lewis, and the Lewises are some way involved in our family tree. So in that respect, it is, but it's not a direct link to Henry. Sam Earl? Sam Earl is definitely a cousin. He's a second cousin of mine. Um, he is, his father and my father were first cousins. Uh, their parents were brother and sister. For seven generations, he is the seventh generation case. My grandparents came to Mandaloking in the 1880s. One, two, three, four, five, six generation Mandaloking. Well, it's strange because every other house down the block is related to some other house on the block except for us. We were just like there. My dad, my grandparents moved into Manaloking when my dad was young and then, you know, we, he ended up loving it and buying a house himself. So my grandmother had a house north of the bridge. We were next to the club and that was it for our family. I'm not related to anybody. In fact, I'm trying to create a new chain. Even today, I haven't lived here as long as I have. I still don't know who, what family is related to what family, but there's a lot of them. I think sometimes people who weren't in the Earl uh, Chance Barton family did feel a little left out of things. <laughs> it's all one big happy genetic glob down here. I am very proud of the fact that I have not one drop of consanguinity with any other person in Mandaloking. Right. So there's, I, am, I am not the product of any inbreeding <laughs> here in a town no, notorious for it. Mandaloking was not only notorious for its intersecting bloodlines, it also had a long-standing competition, a feud, if you will. 
with the neighboring town of Bayhead. <laughs> They're always, the Bayhead man looking rivalry. Chapter what? I don't know. <laughs> Bayhead man looking rivalry. Uh... Hmm. I didn't really hang out with anyone at Bayhead because for us growing up, Bayhead was the enemy. I actually hated Bayhead people for a significant portion of my childhood, and I didn't really know why. <laughs> I don't remember that the Bayhead Manaloking rivalry was that strong. Oh, there's huge rivalry between Bayhead and Manaloking. It really wasn't much of a rivalry. I guess there's always been a rivalry between the two. The rivalry between uh, Manaloki and Bayhead was sometimes ferocious. <laughs> There was a fierce rivalry, socially, in tennis, swimming, on the bay, you name it, there was a rivalry between the two towns. And it was uh, very active uh, and very open. <laughs> I have the impression, but not necessarily the knowledge, that Bayhead had a lot more money than Mandeloking did. What Bayhead, to my mind, lacked was this sense of family and community. We knew that Bayhead had, you know, cocktails at their yacht club and food, and it was all very fancy, you know, dressed up, whereas we didn't even wear shoes ever. Like, only wussies wore shoes. So... <laughs> Bayhead Manilokin rivalry was largely a sailing rivalry. I don't know of any other tension because it was somewhat homogeneous population between the two towns. Although we were really good friends and hung out with people from Bayhead, on the water there was a rivalry between Manilokin Yacht Club and Bayhead Yacht Club. This was mostly expressed in team races. Well, we always had to beat Bayhead. I mean, there, there was, you gotta remember, there was no interclubs in those days. No true interclubs where everybody sailed together. It was always a one-on-one -on -one situation, whether it was Bayhead or Island Heights or Little Egg or you know, Beachwood or Brant Beach. And we would tow up to Bayhead or they'd tow down here. And we'd race for half a day and very competitive. And I always thought we always won, but I think they always thought they won. There was Helen Ill, who became Helen Giamatti, and the White Twins, Summy and Edgar, and Paulding Phelps. Those guys were the enemy, and we got so we didn't like them at all because they were beating us. And how many people has Bayhead sent to the Olympics? How many? Zero. Bayhead Manaloking rivalry? What do you want me to do? Make things up? There was no rivalry. Manaloking was so much better than Bayhead. We always thought we were way better sailors than Bayhead. But thinking back to it, Bev Carr and Nancy Simpson, they, they were really good sailors. They probably did better when we sailed against them in, in their Blue Jays. There was one year that uh, it really felt like it was going to be my year. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, Bev Carr, Bev Finkowski, was blowing like stink, right? It's made for me. She won. So maybe there was a rivalry. Maybe there wasn't. I mean, she won. never considered it a rivalry. I mean, we were vastly superior to the sailors of, of Bayhead. In fact, Bayhead only came into the conversation because if someone made a downwind landing or a, a lousy landing at a Manaloking dock, that was called a Bayhead landing. The Bayhead landing is when you just sail into the dock. And then you'd hear a crash. <laughs> And we sit there and we go, Bayhead, Bayhead landing. <laughs> Didn't they have some sort of landing? Oh, I see. 
you know, the Bayhead people were good sailors, but sometimes they would run hard into the dock and they got the name, oh, that's called a Bayhead Landing, and everybody would know what that meant. And then sometimes they would say, oh, that was a Maniloking Landing, but they weren't. They were Bayhead Landings. A Bayhead Landing. Bayhead Landing. Bayhead Landing. Smack into the dock. They literally didn't know how to land a boat. Do you know who coined the term Bayhead Downwind Landing? I don't know. Did you find out? Uh -uh. I never heard it, but I love it. You Absolutely. It. No, I fully endorse it, though. It's traditional that the wind is blowing out of the south or southeast in the afternoons there. And because of the orientation of Bayhead's docks, you could only land downwind. So they used to come slamming into the dock and bang into the dock. We called the Bayhead Landing. They somehow took offense to this and ended up calling the landings Maniloking Landings. But we never had that problem because our docks ran east-west and we could come up underneath the dock and, and land properly. Um, so the, the misnomer is that it's a man-looking landing. It's really a bayhead landing. Bayhead landing. Bayhead landing. Another bayhead landing. And I understand the reverse would be true if a man-looking type uh, went up to bayhead. But uh, it was almost to a point where kids didn't talk to each other. Uh, and this broke down happily after uh, World War II. And uh, <laughs> your post uh, married a, a Bayhead or married a bad looking girl. Uh, and there started to be a mix that, well, the Bayhead types weren't so bad after all. <laughs> Post was a bayhead boy, and Jane was a mantelloking girl, and it was a big leap for the two of them to come together and bridge that gap. One of the reasons that there's way more camaraderie between bayhead and mantelloking is solely because of Bob and Jane Post. I did marry a bayheader, so, and I love mantelloking and bayhead. For different reasons, actually. Which one, which one do you like more? Oh, well, I'm gonna steal something that Jenny Buck said said to me so eloquently that Maniloking is our family, and Bayhead are our friends. Who did you marry from Bayhead, Mom? What? Who did you marry from Bayhead? I didn't marry anybody from Bayhead. You married Dad was from Bayhead. <laughs> Oh, right. I, I just forget about all that. <laughs> I was a Maniloking person, and I married somebody from Bay Head. I didn't marry Edgar or Sumner or, or Sammy Lovering, who still talks to me and writes me letters. And his wife knows about it, and then she gets on the phone. And so, the fellowship had returned between these two towns. But Henry Coley was correct. Bayhead had not sent anyone to the Olympics. From 1952 through 1966, Mantelow King had someone on every Olympic sailing team. Looking was just full of great sailors. So my next door neighbors, Edgar and Summy White, were identical twins. How identical were they? Well, they both had Olympic gold medals. And they got those Olympic gold medals crewing for the guy from the next house down. That was Brit Chance Sr. And they sailed 5.5 meters in the Helsinki Olympics. Well, that, it was really a matter of economics. <laughs> we had to get airplane tickets to get over there. And their father offered to help, and uh, we hadn't really sailed together much at all. Right. And, uh, and of course, we took Mike's shuttle as well. 
uh, who, with whom we had sailed a lot. I raced my sneak box in the BBYRA in the morning and in the afternoons I crewed for Dr. Chance or Brett Chance in his e -scal. And uh, Sam Merrick also crewed for him and I did that for several years. Then in 1952, Britt decided to uh, see if he could go to the Olympics and uh, he uh, applied and we were the only 5.5 meter in the, America, in the United States at the time. Nobody wanted to build one to compete, to challenge us. So we were a walk-on. So how did Britt ask you to go? Well, I don't remember, except that he asked me to go. He said, Mike, would you like to crew for me in the Olympics? Uh, and I said, sure. I said, sure. Uh, you know, how, yeah. Dr. Chance had a relationship with the Nobel Institute in Sweden, so he spoke Swedish too and knew the Swedes because he'd sailed there in five meters uh, years before that. So he knew the meter class and he knew sailing in the Baltic. So we just did a lot of sailing together. Uh, fortunately, the Swedes were very cooperative and set up a couple of five and a half meters to train us. And we sailed and practiced, and meanwhile, the Swedes had their Olympic trials. So we were a tuning boat for many of the Swedish Olympians. I learned a great lesson at that time. I can remember I was trying to unjam a something or other, and I was forcing it this way and that way, and Dr. Chance tapped me on the shoulder and said, Mike, stop, look at it, figure out what needs to be done and do that. Don't just jam, stop, think, and take action. Fast forward to the Olympics. After five races, Dr. Chance was in fourth place. At that point, Sumner White got sick, and uh, I took his place as the alternate. We were doing very well because of a light air race, and we were the first boat to the weather mark. As we were approaching the weather mark, we realized we hadn't put out the sheet and guy. So we scrambled to put them out, and we actually didn't have them out until we got around the mark. And then Eddie Gar had to go up in the bow and hook the, the halyard and the sheet and guy on the spinnaker. So we were first around, but there was another boat not far behind us, and Dr. Chance started yelling at me, hoist the spinnaker, hoist the spinnaker. And I knew I couldn't hoist the spinnaker because there was no sheet or guy. So I, I just stood there, stop, look at it, do what's right, don't get use your emotions. So he started kicking me. Actually, actually he kicked me. One of the hoisted, and I didn't hoist it until Eddie Guard had it fully hooked on. Then I hoisted it, and we got, we kept our lead, and we went on to win that race. And then they, uh, that was, and then and Sumner got well, <laughs> and he raced the last race, and they won that race too. So they got a gold medal, going from fourth place to first place in uh, two races. We had no idea that we would come out on top, absolutely none, because we hadn't even seen the damn boat. <laughs> if you look at the, at the picture that shows the four of us crew standing beside each other, you'll see that I did not have a blazer. Why? Because my father didn't want to buy me one. <laughs> didn't want to buy me a uniform for the Olympics. No, he... <laughs> Carl Van Dyne went to the Olympics in Finns, and there's a famous story about that race. In the 1968 Olympics, Carl, in the first race, was it the, the, the Mexico City Olympics were sailed in Al Acapulco in the ocean and there were these big rolling waves. And at the time, the marks were styrofoam floats, a bamboo pole, and a flag. So Carl is, you know, hundreds of yards ahead of the next boat. In first place, nobody else around him 
Nobody was near him. Nobody was, could have seen it, nobody or anything else. And he's coming up to the mark and he sees there's big waves. So he literally goes 20 feet outside of the mark to make sure he doesn't hit it. Well, as he's rounding the mark, the mark lays down perfectly on a wave and just nicks his sail. His sail had just skimmed the mark. The tip of his boom just nicked the mark. What does Carl do? He sails over to the committee and drops out of the race. When he sailed over to the committee, the committee said, what are you doing? And, you know, I mean, they had no idea. And he said, I hit the mark. I'm dropping out of the race. He just dropped out of the race and lost his gold medal for that. Great story. Manilokin Yacht Club fostered this relationship for, at least for me, uh, with the Olympic Games. I mean, we, there was a, it just hits me. Uh, I, wow. Um, I get emotional because I spent, uh, I trained for the Olympics twice and I, and unfortunately I failed. I made the U.S. sailing team in 2000. Um, my ba I finished fourth at the Olympic trials. My dad failed, he didn't go to the Olympic, but you know, Carl did. Carl Van Dyne represented the United States and Mexico. There was just a pedigree of Maniloking sailors, you know, with Brit Chance uh, with the gold medal in the 5.5, and Peter Komet in 76, he was training the Finney, he was the first laser world champion. Boycotted in 80, you know, I think Henry Bossett was, uh, was also from the club and, and got on the team for the tornado, but the, got boycotted. And I always felt like when I was representing the United States, um, I was representing Maniloking too, and there's something there was a power in that. There was a belief in, in, inside of me that I had the wind at my back or an advantage because I came from Manilokki. I always felt that. It was a real sense of home here in Manilokin. And the center of it was this yacht club and sailing. Growing up in Manilokin, I mean, the culture was to sail. And, you know, and, and what a lucky thing. Sailing, when I first started racing, there were many fewer classes racing on Barnegat Bay. There was a great nucleus of great sailors in Maniloking. You know, Jan Chance, you know, won the Adams Cup, and you know, you're always sort of trying to emulate what they had done. The Van Dynes and the Comets and the, you know, um, I felt like there was something in the water or something in Maniloking. Sometimes I'd be out at night and I'd come home and I'd get out of the car and the air would smell like clam chowder. You'd wake up in the morning to the sound of the ocean and you'd just, you'd run to the club to sail and... The houses were simple, the people were simple, the cars were simple. Nobody cared if you had a BMW or whatever. You had a Volkswagen. You had the car that you could put your penguin or your laser on the roof of most easily. I don't think that the essence of why people have come here has changed 
Since my great-grandfather came 110 years ago to now, and I, I don't see it changing between now and 100 years from now. Billy says to me sometimes when I'm getting a little grumpy, I think you need to go to Manilow King and get happy. It's now our duty to explain to our kids and grandkids the history of Manilowking and why Manilowking is the way it is and, and what's right and what's wrong and what's important and what's great. Uh, so that, that legacy of tradition passes from generation to generation.